and welcome to She Thinks, a podcast where you're allowed to think for yourself. I'm your host, Beverly Hallberg, and on today's episode, Morgan Ortega's former spokesperson for the U.S. Department of State, joins us to dissect the Biden administration's foreign policy. We'll discuss the recent protests in Cuba, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, and whether or not inviting the UN Human Rights Council experts to investigate racism in the U.S. sets a good example to the rest of the world. But before we bring her on, a little bit more about Morgan. Morgan Ortegas is a seasoned business executive, distinguished public policy and communications professional, and an active U.S. Naval Reserve officer. From 2019 to 2020, 2021, she served at the Department of State as a spokesperson for the United States of America. During this time, she worked closely with the White House on the historic Abraham Accords that brought peace deals between Israel and UAE and Bahrain and Sudan. And as spokesperson, she developed strategic communications plans for every area of U.S. foreign policy. In February of this year, Morgan joined Adam Buller in starting Rubicon Founders, a leading healthcare investment firm. Morgan, thank you so much for joining She Thinks today. I'm thrilled to be with you. Thank you so much. And I want to start with the important things first. You're a new mom. How is motherhood going? How is your little girl doing? She's great. She's eight and a half months now. Um, She is uh, full of life, laughter, uh, she is crawling and spending most of the day terrorizing the dog. <laughs> the, the poor dog, he has been around for 12 or 13 years now and, uh, you know, doesn't understand this little creature that keeps stealing all his bones and putting her hands in his water and food. So they're, they're still adjusting to each other. And how have you adjusted? What is it like to balance family life and work life? You have a busy workload. How how do you manage to seemingly do it all? Although I think it, people often say it's not that you can do everything. It's that you do some things one at a time. It's not that women can always do everything all at once. That's right. Well, I, listen, I think it starts with uh, uh, the fact that I married well. So I have a husband who is just Totally. Um, I, I wouldn't even say he's a 50% partner. I, I think he actually does more than I do sometimes. It might even be 60, 40. So I, I'm just incredibly lucky to have, uh, you know, such a supportive uh, partner, spouse and everything in life and certainly in, in child rearing. And then, you know, I just sort of realized what, what you just said. I think you hit the nail on the head which is something's got to give, right? You don't have all the time that you had before you were single and and obviously children are a blessing. And so I can't cram everything in that I used to, but I try to get to as much as I can. And, uh, you know, if, if, if something drops, something drops, right? But so that's, that's, I guess, the way I look at it now. Well, we so appreciate that you have fit in, she thinks, with your busy schedule. And I want to move on to what I think is interesting this week, and that is this week marks the six months of the Biden administration. So Joe Biden has had six months to roll out what he believes in a, is an effective foreign policy. How would you grade him so far to this point? So as far as a grade, I think I'll say a C for now. There's some things that I like. Uh, as it relates to how they are pursuing, I think, many of the policies uh, from the Trump administration that and, and Mike Pompeo's State Department that we pursued on China. Um, and, and I think that the, the challenge of the Chinese Communist Party and the fact that it wants to uh, challenge not only America, but the West, democracy, and anyone who loves freedom, they want to challenge that in every institution and, and in every sphere around the world. So it, it, the challenge of dealing with the Chinese Communist Party, the challenge of the fact that they want to dominate not only the Asian region, but eventually the world and have the world, the rules based order based on their rules, right, on, on the way the communists want to write them, that challenge is too big for one party. So I, I've always said I'm going to cheer along the Biden administration when I think they get it right um, on, uh, on issues related to China. But the problem is, is that nothing is done in a silo in foreign policy. Nothing is done in isolation. So uh, when you look at what I think was a very disappointing and lackluster uh, response in Cuba, for example, to, to the protests there, um, when, when you look at that, that sends a signal to every other rogue regime around the world uh, of what the Biden administration will and will not tolerate as it relates to people protesting for their freedom. And it really took them, I think, a good, um, I think it took them a good solid week to, to finally get their footing on Cuba. 
Uh, and it doesn't make sense, right? We're talking about something that could be a, a human rights catastrophe, as Senator Rubio has talked about, 90 miles from, from our shores in the United States. Um, so so I say, you know, it's a scene because in some places I think they're getting China right, but in other places like Cuba, that wasn't great. But, but I got to tell you, as it relates to uh, one place that they're dropping the ball in China, and especially Russia, it, it is in the cyber uh, domain. You know, we have seen now, uh, and, and we just saw the uh, the United States come forward and, and blame uh, rogue actors in China uh, for cyber hack. And uh, we obviously have seen that several large attacks on, on the Russian side. So when that's happened from the Russians, when they attack the pipeline, when they attack various critical infrastructure, and Putin sort of took his hands and said, oh, it's not us, it's not the government, it's just these hackers. Uh, I was really arguing forcefully at the time uh, that we need to be doing everything we can to hold the Russian government responsible for what happens on their soil. And just sort of giving, by and Biden keeps giving Putin his pass and saying, well, it's not him, it's not the government, it's these actors. Uh, and I just don't understand what the Biden team, what the president himself and what his team is doing with that response. And I had said, what will happen is other actors, other people, now we know it's the Chinese, uh, at, not just the Chinese, right? It could also be the Iranians, you know, Russians, you know, you name it, right? There's a lot of people with sophisticated cyber capabilities. Whenever other rogue states see that there's no consequences when you just sort of blame it on, you know, local cyber hacking gr- groups in your countries, then that only begets more cyber uh, activity. So, um, I mean, I could, I could go around the world, so I won't do that and go, go for hours. But, but I'll just say in some, some places I like the policies that they're pursuing as it relates to China uh, to, to hold them accountable, but keeping some of the sanctions and things in place, um, especially as it relates to Hong Kong and the genocide in Xinjiang uh, that, that we declared in the Trump administration. So that part's good, but there's other parts of the world where it, it's just, uh, I think it's just a very weak sort of start out of the gate and they've stumbled. And and on the cyber threat, one of the things that I have wondered is when we take a look at Congress, do we think that individual congressmen and women understand cybersecurity well enough to be able to figure out how to protect this country? Do you think that it's essential for the private market, uh, private enterprise to be working hand in hand with the government? Because we are talking about things that are very technical. And and unless somebody is skilled in it, understands it very well, it's very hard to know how to craft legislation in order to protect the country. Yeah, that's so listen, I don't know that I fully understand, uh, fully understand it as much as I need to. I mean, it, it, dealing with cyber uh, hacking uh, is incredibly technical. Um, we have hopefully, you know, some of America's best experts working on this. Uh, but I think it's it, it goes with it, it, what you said is totally right, that that we absolutely have to have uh, the public sector and the private sector working together. But the real thing is is that it doesn't matter in, in some ways, when you think about the doctrine of proportionality for an attack, right, it doesn't matter if it is a cyber attack on our critical infrastructure or if it's a traditional bomb attack on our critical infrastructure in, in some ways. Uh, what I mean by that is you have to think about what is the proportional response. And there's not we, we keep talking about a cyber, at least I think the Biden administration does. Um, in a way that focuses on it being like so spooky and we'll don't know what our response is. And, you know, guys, like it's, it's not 2000 and, uh, you know, nine, right? Like the, the times when we have to, the times when we have to be this secretive about it, I think are behind us. Not that we have to come out and declare an operation, but, but we have to say, you know what? You did X, Y, Z to us. You attacked our critical infrastructure. And here is what we're doing back to you. And you turn over these cyber hackers, Russia and China. Uh, or we're going to continue to hold your government responsible for what happens um, within your nation state. So, so that's a big thing. I think that w- this administration needs to articulate to the American people what what they view as proportional, a re- proportional uh, response when there is a cyber attack on our private companies, on our critical infrastructure. Uh, that needs that needs to be articulated so that our enemies know that there are recourses, right? And, and there's not a lot of public naming and shaming, and there's not a lot of of, of public recourse right now. And it, it gets back to strong statements, a strong, steady narrative. That's something that you know, working as a press secretary, you worked for Mike Pompeo, who all, always had very 
clear, strong stances on things. President Trump also had strong statements in reference to many countries. And you had mentioned earlier the Biden's Biden administration's response to the protest in Cuba, you said, took roughly a week for them to respond. And I found it very interesting that the the rhetoric towards Cuba, even the Secretary of State said not for for Cubans not to come to this country. And at the meantime, we do have people crossing our border. It seems that our narrative right now is not consistent and it's not strong enough against bad actors. First of all, do you agree with that? Second of all, how important is there to be a strong narrative against bad actors in order to help with our diplomacy worldwide? Well, I think what you just said um, sort of weaves in with with what the cyber conversation that we were just having. But what I think is what I think is really important is is not just words, but actions um, and, and the the threat of force, if needed, that back up those words. So let me explain to you what I mean. In the um, in the Obama administration, and Ben Rhodes actually talked about this today whenever he was being interviewed. I think it was at the Atlantic Council. Um, but in the Obama administration, uh, they actually had a lot of really tough words. They would give beautiful speeches condemning uh, rogue act- actors, rogue nations. They would talk very, very tough. But the problem is, is that no one believed them, right? The stuff that they were saying about Syria, uh, and everybody probably remembers the, the famous um, red line statement that President Obama made uh, when he said, you know, Assad couldn't, uh, couldn't cross the, the red line as it relates to gassing his people. And then he did. And then we effectively didn't do anything about it. Um, so, so what's more important than words? And, and trust me, I think words and strong statements are, are, are very important. But, but to me, what's equally important and maybe even more important is, is that our competitors, our friends, our foes, our enemies is that everybody knows uh, that we mean what we say. So I think, you know, for example, when we had to make the, the, I would say tough decision. I actually don't know how tough a decision it was for President Trump. But when President Trump decided to take out Qasem Soleimani, Iran's leading terrorist, the, the state that is the world's largest uh, state sponsor of terrorism, you know, people refused to make that call for de- for a long time. I mean, he's probably, I think he was in power like 20 years. And so, you know, he had been uh, attacking uh, behind attacks that were killing uh, American service members in Iraq. Uh, he'd been, uh, I mean, definitely behind numerous terror attacks behind the IRGC Quds Force. Um, and so there was all this conventional wisdom that you can't take him out, right? Like he's untouchable. And Donald Trump uh, in January of 2020 showed the world that nobody's untouchable, right? And I think that that that, that sort of um, action is, uh, is incredibly important because whenever you say we're going to continue to pursue our maximum economic pressure campaign uh, against the Islamic Republic of Iran, that means that the leaders there in that regime know that that we mean what we say. So we can argue about policy and what we got right, what we got wrong all the time. But but I almost worry about the tough talk without any of the uh, action to back it up. Well, one action that President Biden did stay true to was his withdrawal from Afghanistan it actually happened sooner than what he had even uh, telegraphed for us saying it was going to happen in September. Of course, it happened just a couple weeks ago. And so I just want to get your your insight into where things are in Afghanistan. What are the dangers of a potential rapid Taliban encroachment? What does this mean for our allies in Europe and potential attacks against our allies there? What is your take on how things are? Well, Afghanistan is an incredibly tough situation. So listen, I work for a president, Mike Pompeo worked for a president who made no secret about uh, his uh, ambition to want to wind down what he saw as endless wars um, and, and wind down American military involvement in Afghanistan. So I think Secretary Pompeo did what any prudent Secretary of State would do, which is how do I accomplish this mission for the president? And how do I also make sure uh, that we meet our end goals, which is that uh, a terrorist attack will never uh, harm the American people that emanates from, from Afghanistan, from that land. So we empowered someone named um, Ambassador Khalil Azad, uh, who's an Afghan American, actually, uh, to begin negotiations with the Taliban, uh, with the government, uh, to try and get to a, a peace arrangement. Now, 
we were certainly not naive in that effort. Um, but what we did know is that the status quo was, an unten- was, was untenable. And I think that that's the, the problem that a lot of people in Washington were unwilling, um, were unwilling to recognize, which is that the status quo, you know, just leaving American troops there year after year after year, and we kill a lot of, of Talibs, and then occasionally we have casualties as well. The, the American people were just not with us on, on that outcome, uh, uh, on that policy decision. So, um, so therefore, what we thought is we are going to try our best to negotiate a real peace agreement with the Taliban, uh, but, we are, but we are going to take the drawdown very responsibly and that the drawdown is going to be a conditions-based, uh, conditions-based. Uh, meaning that we had a timetable to, to get forces out of Afghanistan, but that timetable could change if the Taliban didn't live up to its commitments. Um, and Pompeo was very clear with that. So th- that's a long windup to tell you that, you know, we in the Biden administration kept Ambassador Khalil Azad on. What we sort of don't understand is why the rest to just pull everybody out, why, uh, why there's no effort to leave um, a residual force, uh, because there are still uh, elements of Al Qaeda and ISIS um, in uh, Afghanistan that could bring harm to Americans. So I, I see it as, as a hasty and, and, and quick withdrawal of forces that uh, may not have been the time, the way in which we would have done it under the Trump administration. There's no doubt that we were planning uh, that we had a peace agreement um, and that we were planning on uh, pulling out of troops out of Afghanistan. But again, it was all it was all based on the contingency uh, that we felt that there wasn't a, an imminent threat uh, from terrorist forces that could attack the United States. And so, be, because there's just a a, a rapid uh, pullout by the Biden administration, uh, you're you're all seeing in the news as the Talibs, you know, take over district after district after district. Um, and and I think the the unfortunate thing is. Uh, that if we if we watch and say that an Al Qaeda or an ISIS threat festers uh, in Afghanistan, a lot harder to pull resources back in. You'll remember in Iraq in 2009 when uh, President Obama uh, came in and he uh, also campaigned on pulling forces out of Iraq. He pulled them all out. A few years later, ISIS was all over the place. They're beheading journalists right on live television, right. and we had to go back in. Now, we have more forces in, in CENTCOM in that theater. is a little easier to do. We don't have as many bases near uh, Afghanistan. So it's, it's a lot harder just to, to, to go back in if, if needed. Well, before we continue the conversation, I'd like to take a moment to highlight IWF's Champion Women Profile Series, which focuses on women across the country and world that are accomplishing amazing things. The media too often ignores their stories, but we don't. We celebrate them and bring their stories directly to you. Our current profile is Congresswoman Lisa McLean, who represents Michigan's 10th District. To check out her story, do go to IWF.org to see why she's this week's champion woman. And Morgan, I want to turn to another topic that shocked me. I didn't expect this to come out of the Biden administration, and that was their recent decision to have the UN Human Rights Council investigated the United States about racism within the United States. So first of all, did this surprise you as well, or was this something that you kind of expected the Biden administration to do? Did they telegraph this in any way? And what do you think this means to other countries, especially countries such as China that is has these horrific human rights violations against the Uyghur population? What do you think this means to have the Human Rights Council investigate us on issues of racism? So I guess we should have seen it coming because the uh, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations did something that I and and many others, I think, thought was quite disgraceful and concerning, which is one of her early speeches um, at the United Nations, where, again, she's representing the United States. Uh, She talked about how our founding principles and documents were founded on uh, things like white supremacy. Um, and I don't have the exact quote and everything that she said uh, uh, in front of me, uh, but but that was the the tone and the tenor of of her remarks. Um, and, and I just think that it's first of all, it's ridiculous to to say that. Uh, secondly, what does it say to the thousands of people around the world who who face uh, real racism and who face 
uh, real, you know, uh, regimes that are that are just terrorizing and, and brutalizing their people. You go, it, it goes beyond racism, which is terrible, right? It's, it's, it's just utter brutalization of those people. So what does it say to the people of Cuba, the protesters in Iran uh, that uh, that happen? Uh, what does it say to the people of Hong Kong? All of all of these cities and all of these places where there's people protesting for freedom and human rights and 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 an end to tyranny. One of the common themes is that these people hold the American flag often in their protest, right? They're respectful of the American flag, and so whenever you have people around the world who live in dire dire circumstances under uh, terrible regimes under tyranny, right? When they look at the American flag, that is their symbol of, of freedom. That is their symbol of hope, right? You could be in the worst situation uh, in Hong Kong with the Chinese Communist Party thugs breathing down your neck. You see that American flag and it gives you hope. But when you in turn have the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations uh, saying that, that uh, actually... When you look at that flag, actually our founding principles, our founding documents are based on white supremacy. It, 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 it's ludicrous and it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it angers me because that's not the America that we should be presenting to the world. We are the America that Ronald Reagan said is the shining city on the hill. Um, and that doesn't mean we're perfect. No one's saying we're not more perfect. There's not things to, to fix in our country. But when you think it's appropriate to use that language about your own country to the rest of the world in one of your opening speeches at the United Nations, um, that just shows you where the mindset um, uh, of this administration is. So I'm, I, I'm disappointed in, in Blinken. I, I think that they, I, I, in some ways, I sort of, I understand their logic that they're saying, you know, listen, we're not above scrutiny. We're not above examining our own flaws. We're not above, uh, you know, f- f- fixing uh, terrible injustices in our country. And no doubt there is racism and terrible injustices in our country. But why do we need the United Nations to help us fix that? Right. This is we, and um, by the way, we don't. Right. This is why we have freedom of speech. This is why we have um, freedom of the press. Right. This is why we have an open society where you may get mad on each other on cable television, right? You may disagree with each other, but we have a society where we can openly debate what's right, what's wrong, how we fix things, right? We don't need uh, a separate entity to tell us uh, what to do to fix ourselves. And, and, and especially when that separate entity is the farce of the Human Rights Council at the United Nations. I mean, this is an entity that has China, Russia, Venezuela, Cuba, Pakistan. I mean, there's literally a genocide, a genocide going on right now in China, in Xinjiang against Muslims. And these people are going to sit on the Human Rights Council and lecture us about racism that will be a, a very hard pass for me, Beverly. Oh, it's it's laughable. And my final question to you picks up on China itself. It's interesting as we've had this conversation, China is a part of most of the questions that I asked in the answers that you gave. Whether we're talking about Afghanistan or Cuba, there is a China connection. And yes, it is very mm-hmm. difficult for any administration to know the exact steps that one should take in dealing with China because it's it's, it's very tricky to know exactly what to do. But the final question is, what advice would you give to Americans? So for those who are concerned about the rise of China, is there anything the average American can do? Is there anything you would encourage them to do? That's a really great question. Um, first of all, I think it's important to to educate yourself and to be cognizant of the issues. Um, one of the things that you can do um, is, to, is to look at where you consume products and make sure that you're not buying um, from people uh, who, who may be uh, making products in China from the forced labor camps in Xinjiang. Now, um, that's, that's going to sort of solve itself uh, soon a little bit because uh, there was a bipartisan bill in the Congress that passed that American companies can't be involved in this. Uh, but there were some very, very concerning comments coming out of uh, like Nike and Apple, 
and, and they really were were um, were excusing, in, in, in my opinion, in many ways, were excusing the forced labor and the genocide in Xinjiang. Uh, and you also have to look at Hollywood. I mean, Hollywood just you know completely uh, is bought and paid for by the Chinese, and uh, as it relates to funding many of their uh, many of their movies, and will not be critical. So I, I think it's important to be a conscious uh, consumer. Um, not, listen, I, well, I should work out more than I do, but Nike was one of my favorite <laughs> brands, um, and I'm yeah. just not I'm just not buying it anymore because I, I just think you know if you can have that casual of an attitude towards genocide because of the market available to you in China, like I just you know there's there's, there's other brands that that I can go to. Um, and the other point is to stay on top of your issue on top of the issues and. And be vocal, not just with your federal uh, legislators, but be vocal with your state legislators as well. You know, there's many, many ways in which the Chinese Communist Party encroaches at the local level. Uh, they have um, uh, the they have these Confucian centers on campuses, on, on many American campuses. Uh, we tried, we did a lot actually to get rid of that, to put restrictions in place in the Trump administration. But, you know, be careful if your kids are at college, you know, uh, talk to the guidance counselors, talk to the leadership at the at the college, uh, make sure that there aren't there a Confucius Center. And if there is, you should, you know, we don't have time to go into it today, but research it, look into it um, and, and make sure that you don't stand and tolerate those other things, those sorts of things. And then finally, I would say one of the best things you can do is, is to support uh, Asian Americans and Chinese Americans. I got to tell you that two of Pompeo's most senior advisors at the State Department on China issues uh, were two Chinese Americans, and, and both of them grew up in mainland China uh, under that communist regime. And, and and they were better. I mean, listen, you could have worked your whole life as an American in China, learned Mandarin, but you would never be able to compare to to the knowledge uh, that someone, uh, you know, who was a native growing up in China, you know, what they had. And so their insight, and let me tell you, there were more they were more conservative than uh, the Mike Pompeo, right? He used to laugh about that. He says, wow, I think you guys are to the right of me. Um, and, and so I think it's important to remember that, you know, our, our Asian American, uh, you know, brothers and sisters here, many of them come from not only China, but places like Vietnam. You know, talk to, talk to a Vietnamese American about what it's like to, to live, uh, you know, near the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and what that really means, uh, not not just, you know, being someone inside China, but but being a neighbor to them and what, and what that's like. And I think that there's a lot uh, that we can learn um, about countering uh, China, the Chinese Communist Party in this era of great power competition uh, from our from our brilliant and talented Asian uh, American brothers and sisters. And I like you. I've stopped by Nike. I'm still trying to figure out how to get Apple products out of my life, but they're so ingrained in everything oh, I that I do from computer to phone to everything. <laughs> so still thinking about that, but I think those are just really good suggestions on what each of us can do when we're concerned. And so I just thank you so much for your insight on that and your insight on the Biden administration's foreign policy. And of course, for joining us on She Thinks. Morgan Ategas, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, I could go on for another 30 minutes, but I'm sure you guys have other things to do, but I'd love to come back and be with you another time. Well, we would appreciate that. Thank you again. And thank you for joining us. Before you go, Independent Women's Forum does want you to know that we rely on the generosity of supporters like you. And investment in IWF fuels our efforts to enhance freedom, opportunity, and well-being for all Americans. Please consider making a small donation to IWF by visiting iwf.org backslash donate. That is iwf.org backslash donate. And last, if you enjoyed this episode of She Thinks, do leave us a rating or a review on iTunes. It does help. Also, we'd love it if you shared this episode and let your friends know where they can find more She Thinks episodes. From all of us here at Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.